Number 10, Amelia Earhart. An American aviation pioneer and celebrated figure in the early 20th century, Amelia Earhart was the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Notably, in 1932, she became the first woman to fly solo non-stop across the Atlantic Ocean, covering a distance of over 2,000 miles from Newfoundland, Canada to Northern Ireland. Beyond her aviation achievements, Earhart was a prominent advocate for women's rights. She encouraged women to pursue careers and goals that were traditionally considered to be male-dominated. Earhart was also an author and a, pub and a popular public speaker, which I wish I could do, and she wrote several books about her experience in aviation and women's issues. In this photo, what seems to be a normal photo of Amelia is actually the last photo we have of her before she went missing. She may have survived her round the world attempt only to be later captured by Japanese forces. According to a newly discovered photograph, and according to the New History Channel documentary, the photo is found in a National Archive file as it has shown Earhart alive after her plane fell low on fuel during her mission. The photo depicts a woman believing to be Earhart and a man who looked like her navigator, Fred. A Japanese ship can be seen in the background, carrying what appears to be her plane, as her fate has been debated for decades and has sparked several conspiracy theories. Monet, what do you guys think? Are people just hopeful? Number 9, Volcano. We all love a good nature tour or park hike, but for this man, David Johnston, he really loved the nature of volcanoes and geology, and ultimately pursued his education in the field. He was working with the US Geological Survey at the Cascades Volcano Observatory in Vancouver, Washington, and he was assigned to monitor the activity of Mount St. Helens, a stratovolcano that had been been showing recently a lot of activity. This photo is when he was doing his research on the earthly giant, but tragically on May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted explosively, triggering a massive landslide and a pyroclastic flow. David Johnston was stationed at the observation post on the ridge known as Coldwater 2, about six miles north of the volcano. He radioed in the now famous message, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it, to his colleagues at the USGS headquarters, alerting them to the eruption. Regrettably, Johnston's post was directly in the path of the advancing pyroclastic flow and he perished in the eruption alongside with many others. His body was unfortunately never recovered and he was only 30 years old. Number 8, the 1986 Challenger. I love space and I think space is really amazing and cool as so did these guys, the crew members of the Challenger. Francis R. Scooby, Michael J. Smith, Ronald McNair, Alison Onezuka, Judith Resnick, Gregory Jarvis, and Christina McAuliffe. The Challenger mission was unique because it included Christina, a civilian school teacher who was selected to be the first private citizen to fly in space as part of NASA's Teacher in Space program. However, the Challenger suffered a massive disaster when the failure of an O-ring seal in the right solid rocket booster. Cold temperatures in the morning of the launch weakened the O-ring's elasticity, allowing hot gases to escape and damage the external fuel tank, leading to an explosion that was witnessed by millions of people around the world, and it was a devastating blow to NASA and the space program. Following the disaster, the space shuttle program was suspended for over two years, and significant changes were made to the shuttle's design and launch protocols. After its investigation, the disaster also led to a renewal focus on the importance of safety in human spaceflight. Calling all the ancient astronauts, number seven will be about the thigh bone. As you can imagine, this picture you see on screen caused quite a kerfuffle online after NASA released the image in 2014. Understandably so, because this appears to be a thigh bone smack dab in the middle of Mars. NASA, who's just so tired of us and likely assumed that this would happen, pretty much instantaneously released a statement that no, this is not a human or an alien or whatever's thigh bone. This is apparently just a rock that very conveniently eroded by wind or water to look like that. Because notoriously, there's lots of wind and water on Mars. Literally. Anyway, sorry folks, no alien burial grounds are on Mars if we want to believe the space people company. Number six, we get to check out the Skull Nebula, which to me looks like a circle. I don't know, I'm not very sold, but apparently this bad boy creeps a lot of folks out. The Skull Nebula is a consistent in our galaxy, built up of several stars doing an elaborate orbital dance, in the words of NASA. This particular picture was taken in 2020. What earned it the skull name was obviously its ghastly colors, reminiscent of, well, a flayed human skull. The telescope's view highlights of the nebula's hydrogen in red and oxygen content, which is light blue. Also, if you kind of turn your head to the left like this and look at it sideways, you can kind of see the two stars sitting in what's arguably the eye sockets, a thick red cloud making up the nose, and the empty space where cheeks are meant to be surrounding teeth. So what do you think? Spooky scary skeleton or space dodgeball? Next up is what you probably see when you die. It's number five, the carbon star. This one, unlike the last, kind of got me. It seemed unassuming at first, but the longer you stare in the little orange glow of the void, the more you pick up. The hexagonal patterns of mist, the layers and colors, it all amounts into a tunnel of sheer oblivion reminiscent to light speed in Star Wars. I feel like if you drink a little bit a funky tea and pull 
this picture up on a laptop, you could possibly discover the meaning of the universe somewhere in it. Dare you to try if you're brave. This baleful orange eye is carbon star CW Leoas as seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. NASA and the European Space Agency captured this image in 2021 as the star collapsed inwards upon itself and died. More ghastly figures of the sky. Let's do Ghost Nebula for number four. Another entrancing surrealist painting esque image. This photo captured in 2018 by the Hubble Space Telescope is depicting the ghost nebula that haunts the constellation of Cassiopeia. It's absolutely beautiful. It's spectral like appearance coming from a veil of swirling gases and dusts. As mentioned, it really does have the cadence of a surrealist painting. To give you comparison, this untitled piece by Salvador Dali shows textures, tones, and shifting lines I personally find reflective and even haunting about this particular space formation. Even if humans cannot see such things as the ghost nebula with our own two eyes, as we stand on Earth with our own two feet, the connection between man and the divine above has always shown through in art. How we spent so long staring up at the wonders above us that even unwittingly, without ever truly seeing them, we've always found ways to capture and convey the sky, the stars, and their artistic fluidity into something two dimensional, such as the wisps of a surrealist painting. And now we're incredibly lucky to capture these beautiful space formations, such as the Ghost Nebula, in images like the one I can show you today. Number three will have you ready to sing This is Halloween. It's a jack o' lantern sun. Isn't that the funnest thing you've ever seen, though? And while it may look like an impressive feat of Photoshop, this is actually a purely natural phenomena. Similar to our earlier gaping moth, still such an ew name, this jack o' lantern face is the result of a series of active regions on the sun bursting and bubbling, making what appears to be a cosmic pumpkin carving appear on the sun. Or maybe it was the work of Jack Skellington. For number two, we're going to stare into the scariest void of all, the eye of a typhoon. This is our Earth, the one we're on right now, obviously. And in March of 2015, Typhoon Masak, also called Typhoon Shedang, went, spent a week ravaging the Philippines, killing five and injuring dozens. During that time, astronauts at the International Space Station were able to look down upon the Category 5 storm, prompting the European Space Agency astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti to capture the horrifying image you see on screen. The power of the formation is visible even from the safe distance of space as rain and lightning hide behind the deadly swirl. And coming in at number one is Space Station After Dark. While it could arguably be a still from Insidious 16, the Space Spectre, this nightmare picture is actually just part of the European Space Agency's astronauts Alexander Gerst's photo series, which he naturally chose to make about, no, 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 not pretty stars or colors or earth cloud rotations, no, 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 no. His collection was the International Space Station at night, which evidently is horrifying. But Gerst had been up in space for a full year at this point, so I mean, to him, this was bread and butter, baby. Or maybe freeze-dried bread and butter. The main photo I'd like to address is the empty space suits with covers over the helmets, which look like a good start to a horror film. Honestly, maybe I never recovered from that alien horror film life, but space just isn't for me. Starting off with S for Secrets. Alrighty, so here is from the Polish Constitution Day celebration in Chicago, specifically the one from 1978. On the left there, all washed out and crappy old flash display style is First Lady Rosalind Carter. The guy shaking her hand, or rather just holding it and staring off camera like a waiter just went by with a tray of warm sausage rolls he wants to really get in into is John Wayne Gacy. And if you're also thinking, yo, what is up with this guy being in so many random famous photos? You're absolutely right, and it's genuinely strange how photographed and out there Gacy was. By the time this was taken, he had already killed over 20 people. Also, when he wasn't side hustling as a clown, he was super active in the government and politics, thus why wearing the S on the lapel. It was given to him by the Secret Service to indicate special security clearance. So the S literally does stand for secrets, both the US government and his own, whose secrets are worse than so, huh? Huh? Anyways, at the bottom of the handshake photo, you can see the handwritten address to John Gacy, best wishes, Rosalind Carter. I've heard beauty is pain, but I haven't heard beauty is the next Saw movie? Check out the beauty calibrator. Seeing pictures, you may think it's some sort of Middle Ages torture machine, or as said, literally one of those Saw movie head devices. But surprisingly not, it's another way to point out women's insecurities and find the smallest things possible to make them feel bad over. Meet the Max Factor beauty calibration machine. It is the only one in existence 
confidence, thank God, and in 1932, the makeup legend Max Factor came up with this ingenious invention combining fearonology, cosmetics, and insecurity gaslighting with pseudoscience analysis of a woman's physical flaws. Max Factor's beauty calibrator enabled Hollywood makeup artists to pinpoint where facial corrections needed to be made down to a literal fraction. The machine, also known in the trades as the beauty micrometer, revealed that a natural perfect face was a myth. Every single woman was imperfect and needed correction, and this machine could find it by taking precise measures. It would mark spots that needed to be fixed, and then the artist, once the helmet was removed, could correct all the new insecurities with makeup that you didn't have before you put the stupid thing on. Next up is a photo that's all dramatic flair, the death card. Masseria represented an outdated mindset in the mafia world, one that could no longer be reasoned with diplomatically. The same is true of his rival, Maranzano. The ongoing tit-for-tat killing between the two genuinely wreaked havoc on not only the streets, but in the mafia hierarchy itself. Those resistant to change generally don't last long, and meetings of the mafia elite tried to bring around at the end of bloodshed, but Maranzano especially consistently manipulated matters to his own advantage. In order to facilitate underworld peace, the consensus turned from diplomacy to the inevitable. One of these guys had to go. The final straw, according to the account of Nicola Gentile, was when the police informants called Masiria and said knock off the violence. Having an idealism for peace, he actually responded by disarming his men, and they were all pissed. Joe the boss, Masiria, his bodyguards, and Lucky Luciano all met at a seafood restaurant at 3 p.m. on April 15th of 1931. Luciano excuses himself from the card game while that they're playing to visit the bathroom. This is the signal for the hitmen. The bangs could be heard from around the block, apparently, as Joe was hit from behind four times in the back and one in the head. And it's born, the infamous Ace of Spades shot. It added to the cult status of this hit, but many expect that the Ace of Spades card was placed between Mysterious Fingers after the hit by a photographer just for the shock factor of the press. Number seven, Menendez Brothers. We're all fans of something, whether it's art, music, or sports, and for the Menendez Brothers, they would be so excited to see that they happen to be in the photo card, but the most disturbing part of this photo is the fact that these two killed their parents before the photo was even taken. They went on a six month spending binge with their money. The case was so shocking to the media, including how after the deaths occur, the brothers went to watch James Bond's License to Kill and tried to use it as an alibi. How a week prior, their mother confided to her therapist that she was worried that her sons were psychopaths and how one brother brought an entire chicken wing restaurant with the parents' money after they had passed away. Their father was an executive in the entertainment industry and both went into private schools and the older brother, Lyle, was briefly enrolled in Princeton. After two deadlocked juries, LA prosecutors retired the brothers in a courtroom that did not allow cameras and the new jury found them guilty on two counts of the first degree. They were sentenced by the judge to life in prison. Number six, Aquino. Filipino people have been known to fight resistance against paralysis and oppressors as that seems to be all of our history to be composed of, and that is the truth. And for Ninoy Aquino, he was opposing threat as the political activist against the long dictatorship and assailant of the martial law, Fernandez Marcos. He tried to run for president in 1973, but then Marcos declared martial law in 1972, preventing him to run. Benigno Aquino, or as we know by his nickname, Ninoy Aquino, was imprisoned by the Marcos regime for speaking out against him where he was locked in prison and tormented for seven years. It wasn't until he suffered a heart attack did Marcos' wife Emilda allowed him to go to the United States to get treatment, only under the condition that he does not come back home to the Philippines. But Aquino knew that his love for the people and the Philippines was more important as there were many people wrongfully prosecuted or just be found dead on the street for protesting against Marcos. He did plan to go back and before he arrived to the Philippines, he warned reporters, hey, this might be the last time you ever actually speak to me. And he was right. In this photo was the photo before he left the plane out towards the Philippines airport. He kept saying he had a bulletproof vest on, but the assailant shot him in the head. There were countless reporters that day that knew something was going on only for them to be all shocked to see his body on the ground. There's even footage of his assassination on Line, and his death sparked an outrage throughout all of the Philippines asking for justice. But of course, the United States always has to get involved in something, and they were able to get the Marcos family out of persecution from the very people he tormented and controlled for years. Number five, Tyler Hadley. Everyone likes a good party selfie, including Tyler Hadley, who we can see here drinking a party cup with some friends. But what they don't know is that if they walked into the master bedroom was the killed bodies of his parents that he ended moments before the party. Tyler allegedly decided how he wanted to commit the crime a few weeks prior to committing them. He often told a friend exactly exactly what he was planning to do at the time, noting that having a big party after a parasite had never been done before. Shortly after noon, Tyler wrote on his Facebook wall, party at my crib tonight, 
Maybe. Around 60 people attended the party at that night, and several had alleged to have noticed the smell of dead bodies. Gross. During the party, Tyler apparently told several people about what he had done. Tyler went on a short walk with a friend and Michael Mandel and confessed the crime. After returning to the party, Mandel discovered the bodies of Blake and Mary Jo in the master bedroom. Mandel did not leave the party immediately. In fact, he had continued to spend hours with Tyler and even took a selfie with him, which is what we see. Four hours later, Mendel left the party and called the local crime hotline to report the incident, which is pretty smart on his end because if he did something, then you know Tyler would have done something to him. News of the crime was then spread by word of mouth and Haley was arrested early in the next morning. Number four, Tank Man. When it comes to revolution, all it takes is one person. After all, a single grain of rice can tip the scale. The Tank Man photograph was taken on the morning of the 5th of June, 1989, the day after the Chinese government had violently suppressed protests in Tiananmen Square. An estimated 10,000 civilians were killed in the massacre following weeks of a student-led demonstration in Beijing and beyond against the communist regimes and the suppression of basic human rights and freedom of expression. The image captures a lone man standing in the middle of the Chang and Avenue just off the square facing down a column of four slowly advancing Type 59 tanks of the Chinese army in a defiant protest. The identity of the tank man still remains anonymous as people don't know what happened to him after, but he has been noted as a notable figure in the stance against militia harm to the people. Number three, Jolie Kellen. When it comes to love, if you know something is off, listen to your gut and be safe first. Unfortunately for Jolie, she only left one memory to a friend that if something ever happened to her, they know who the cause was. In 2015, 18 year old Jolie Kalen was hiking with her ex boyfriend Lauren Bunner when he photographed her on a cliff before he pushed her off of it. The 20 year old killer nearly escaped justice by claiming he was on the autism spectrum in court. This is the exact photo before he pushed her off. Bunner later called the cops and said, I just want to turn myself in for the crime of my ex girlfriend that happened just a little while ago on Cheheha Mountain. Later Later that evening, on August 30th, 2015, police found her body still wearing her backpack. Cops believe that he had lured Callahan, who still wanted to remain friends with her former boyfriend, there to kill her because she wouldn't take him back. The court heard him bragging to cellmates about killing the 18-year-old, saying if he couldn't have her, no one else could. Number two, Omeg. If you're lucky, you may have had some cute outing photos with your family and friends when you were younger, and this particular photo seems like an ordinary day with a young girl and her dad, but unfortunately it was actually moments before an explosion incident caused by the real IRA or the real Irish Republican Army. A provincial Irish Republican Army splinter group who opposed the IRA ceasefire and the Good, day Fri and the Good Friday Agreement signed earlier that year. The explosion killed 29 people and injured about 220 others. The red Vauxhall Calvier containing the bomb, I can't say, can I say bomb? The red, Volkswagen, the red Vauxhall Calvier containing the explosion, this photograph was taken shortly before the explosion, and the camera was found afterwards in the rubble. The man and the child in the photo both survived, and the injured survivor, Marion Radford, described hearing an unearthly bang followed by eeriness, a darkness that had just come over the place, then screams as she saw bits of bodies, limbs on the ground while she searched for her 16-year-old son. Alan. She learned. She later discovered he had been killed yards away from her after the two became separated just minutes before the blast. And finally, number one, Andes. Personally, one of the most creepiest photo, and it actually made me feel pretty uncomfy with this one. Seems like a cool crew cut photo of just a bunch of dudes. When in reality, these are the survivors of an Air Force Flight 571 crash in the Andes. Pilot Fer Ferardas had flown across the Andes 29 times previously, and on this flight, he was training a co-pilot, La Guara, who was at the controls. As they flew through the Andes, clouds obscured the mountains and the controller in Santiago, unaware the flight was still over the Andes, authorized him to descend to 11,500 feet. The rugby players on board joked about the turbulence at first until some passengers saw that the aircraft was very close to the mountain. That was probably the moment when the pilots saw the Black Ridge rising dead ahead. After the crash, of the 45 people on the aircraft, three passengers and two crew members of the tail section were killed when it broke apart. The survivors had little food, only eight chocolate bars, a tin of mussels, three small jars of jam, a tin of almonds, a few dates, candies, dried plums, and several bottles of wine. Eventually, their friends made an agreement that if they ever died, they would offer themselves for them to eat, and so they did. The group survived by collectively deciding to eat flesh from the bodies of their dead comrades, and in the photo you can see on the right, a spine. At the end, eight people were rescued and they lived. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Mad Bomber. This is a photo that was taken of someone known as the Mad Bomber. His real name is George Metzky, and he was the man who terrorized New York City for 16 years while he planted explosives in public places like an absolute psychopath. I guess he was apparently angry about a workplace injury he had suffered in the years prior to his terrible crimes. And so, of course, the normal reasonable jump to make would be 
Um, not that at all. While no one should have ever had to suffer because of these crimes, the good news is that while he planted 33 bombs and set off 22 of them, miraculously only 15 people ended up injured in the end. This photo of him behind bars is extremely eerie thanks to his creepy smile and haunting eyes. I might be the only one who feels it, but it just seems like something's off. You know? In our number nine spot today, we have the figures of the fire. This photo is both extremely unsettling and super captivating as it shows a scene after the great fire at Madame Tussauds in 1925. Of course, this wax museum is famous for the extremely lifelike wax figures that are created and find their home there, so you can only imagine the aftermath of the fire. These lifelike figures with missing heads and appendages, burnt skin and hair, and just clothing in disarray. Seeing this photo for the first time without knowing the story behind it was definitely a bit of a confusing and terrifying experience. The heads on the ground really freaked me out for a full five seconds. As scary as it is, I'm glad to hear it's not real and just some creative casualties rather than what this photo appears to be at first. In our number eight spot today, we have the Spectre. This is a photo that was taken in England in 1963, and it became known as the Spectre of the Newbie Church. That is, of course, because of the ghostly figure that can be seen in the photo. I personally am always a little suspicious of ghost photos. Some are certainly more convincing than others, but Photoshop in 1963 wasn't exactly as accessible and easy as it is now. This photo is said to have been taken by Reverend K.F. Lord inside of the Newbie Church, which is located in North Yorkshire, England. Of course, I mean, like many of us are going to do, people were really skeptical of this apparition and just believed it was a well done case of double exposure, which to be fair, is entirely possible. The reverend continued to swear up and down however that the photo was not doctored, so at this point there's no proof to prove either side and it's just a game of he said she said. So what do you guys think? Apparition caught slipping or is the reverend just making it up? Next is a series of photos recovered before they could be lost. Holes in a window. Former LAPD reserve officer turned photographer America Morton was faffing around in the LA Police Department when he comes across a stash of LAPD crime photos ranging in the dates of 1920s all the way to the 1970s. These were cellulose nitrate based film and the negatives were so decomposed they're deemed fire hazard. But Merrick saw enough of the few stills to know that they'd be an absolute effing gold mine. Working with Phototech and Photo Digitation Service and the US National Film Archive, the photos were given a new life. This collection is NSFW and there are hundreds. Now spruced up, the macabre photos are mostly crimes and many of them violent and depicting the bodies or surviving victims injuries. Obviously the ones you're seeing on screen as I'm talking are tamer, such as my choice, the one you're seeing now, holes in the car window. Something about it gives me a deep sense of discomfort, thus the choice. The collection contains recognizable crimes and faces too, an unusual photo of Malaya Nurmi dressed as Vampira, pictures of comedian Lenny Bruce's OD in March of 1966, and images of the Manson family arriving at their arrangement in 1970. Every photo is scary and every Every single has a disturbing backstory. Some captions are provided by author James Elroy in his book LAPD 53. You can win, but sometimes you still lose in the end. It's the devastated Disney's. Meet Howard Ashman and Alan Menken. There are some everyday photos of these two in their prime. Who were they? In case you couldn't tell by all the Disney crap in the background of said photos, they played somewhat of a big role. You know, writing the lyrics and music for Oliver and Company, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and Beauty and the Beast, as well as a few others. Also not to mention creating the Little Shop of Horrors, which got them hired by Disney in the first place. And in this photo you see now, they had just won the Oscars for the Little Mermaid. Hooray! But why does Ashman look so unhappy? This was his life's accomplishments. It's because that night Ashman told Menken they needed to have a serious talk when they got back to New York. And when they get back a few days later, Ashman admits that he has HIV that's quickly progressed and he's going to die soon and fast. They had been songwriting partners for over a decade and were in the middle of working on Beauty and the Beast and despite the illness, Ashman completed the lyrical work and the initial work on Aladdin. On the morning of March 14, 1991, he does die from heart failure caused by his condition. At the time of his death, he only weighed 80 pounds, he'd lost his sight and could barely speak, and a voice that spoke so eloquently through song was lost forever. Before he passed, however, Disney production scrambled to finish the film so he could see a screening of it. The film earned Ashman and Menken three 1991 Academy Award nominations for Best Song and the title song winning the award. Perhaps most amazingly, Beauty and the Beast was the first animated film ever nominated for an Academy Award for Best Motion Picture. So it looks like a photo of two men achieving their
living their wildest dreams, but it's a record of their last normal moment together. Oh look, it's the D-Bags day off. Camp staff, check out this jolly go lucky group. They got the day off of work because the weather was nice for the first time in a long time. During the war time, that must have been awesome, especially being young. Finally shirk responsibility, maybe go get a pint, have a picnic, hang out with each other, maybe get a little frisky, lavishing in the sun. I'm done looking at them. In fact, I'm sick by having to look at them. When that group of people is not have lighted and silly summer fun on a day off, they're going back to their jobs at the camps of World War II. To do exactly what you're thinking they would be doing for work when I say they work at the camps of World War II. And they enjoyed it. This wasn't one of those mandatory war jobs or excuses you can make up for following orders. These young adults who may as well be the grandmothers, grandfathers, or great grandma or pa of people even watching chose to do this job and actively enjoyed it. So this is a good reminder, it's not that far in the past and these people most likely took lives shortly before or after this photo was taken. Uh, did Halloween come early or is it just Sylvester Claus? Yeah, so um, I chose this photo out of trust me like thousands of equally creepy ones because I feel it truly captures the what the bleep factor this holiday has. And they do it every 31st of December to 13th of January. The Sylvester Claus in of Ernach and the surrounding area Appenzell custom that is famous throughout Switzerland. The custom derives its charm from the unique blending of contrasts such as nature and art, mystery and tradition, harmony and anarchy. The Sylvester Claus that ushered the old year out and ring in the new. There are three types of these clauses. The beautiful, the ugly, and the pretty ugly. Common to all the clauses are bells in various shapes and sizes that they wear on their bodies. Their rituals begin in the early morning each day. The various shupel meet at the village square before each group goes its own way. A group will pull up in front of your house, then hop around and jump up and down to make the bells ring, and then they start yodeling at you. You listen to the yodel, they say happy new year, give you some cash, some liquor you have to drink from a straw, and then they just leave. Dark backstory gossip, however, in times of poverty and hunger, which afflicted the region frequently, Clausen was a way to earn a little extra money, and in the 1930s, what was known as Belchel Claus, aka the Beggar Claus, began to appear on the streets. Essentially homeless Santa Clauses, but Santa looked like that. As a result, the influx of beggars in the Claus Guide resulted in heavy restrictions, and in the 1950s, the custom had nearly died out. It's only thanks to the initiative of individuals in the 1970s that this got to come back and enjoys enormous popularity today. Somebody come get their creepy uncle. Cannot tell me this isn't the energy this photo gives. Creepy uncle. The woman is unidentified, but definitely a follower to be able to handle that guy's BO and greasy hands on her. It was taken of the Children of God leader, David Berg. This group started in 1968 in California after Berg claimed God himself had gifted him with prophecies. In reality, Berg started making extreme demands of his followers, give up their money, worldly possessions in exchange for limited outside access horrible cramped living conditions, brainwashing, and oh yeah, a b would make this group famous for really bad reasons I can't and would rather not get into. Former members of COG have been outspoken about the childhood they suffered growing up in the communes. Actress Rose McGowan, the most famously outspoken, published her story of nine years in the group. Actors Joaquin and River Phoenix, also raised in the cult, had it harder than Rose and that trauma plagued River especially. He was actually the original heartthrob of the 80s and 90s, a role, fun fact, DiCaprio only managed to take once River's substance addiction caused by his traumatic childhood unfortunately took his life. So more of an unfun fact, but the matter stands that River painted the way for DiCaprio and this psycho ruined a lot of people's lives. Have you ever seen a photo you can feel? Before you see the photo itself, you're going to learn about the man in it. So Joseph Goebbels, a national socialist politician and propagandist who held multiple high rank roles in the uh, Yahtzee party. As a party chief for Greater Berlin, 1926 to 45, Reich leader of propaganda, 1929 to 45, and in 1933, the push broom mustache twit appointed Joseph the Minister for Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. He was a devout, unbridled, through and through bigot, a tireless agitator, and the propaganda this man designed, wrote, and funded had shipped through dozens of countries and shaped the perspective of Jews in a way that can actually never be undone. It's this propaganda many people still cite when asked for factual basis or logical argument as what Jews had done oh so wrong. It's Joseph who orders the mass burning of literature, who sentenced thousands 
thousands to death and who made up lies to ensure hatred, a hatred that still stands today. And I want you guys to see how he looked at them. So here is the photo, finally. This is a picture of Joseph Goebbels taken only seconds after he found out the photographer was Jewish. In this photo, you can feel it. And it's effing terrifying. And now, the last photo is from El Monte, 6 May. That's the date written on this photo from the LAPD Collective. And it's the only other photo from said collection I chose to put on this list aside from the holes in the car window. As follows is the photo and James L. Roy's written description of it. This is a detective modeling a mask worn by Baxter Shorter's crew. Shorter was in a gaggle with Emmett Perkins, Jack Santos, and Barbara Graham. The three of them then killed an old woman named Mabel Monahan on 9 March 1953. Shorter was appalled by his gaggle's violence. He ratted the others out and Santo and Perkins kidnapped him in front of his pad on Bunker Hill, took him to the mountains, and killed him. Shorter had a sister that lived in El Monte and they were hunting through it for evidence. This mask was in her pad, James Elroy. If Mabel Monahan's former son-in-law, Tudor Scherer, hadn't been a Las Vegas gambler, the 60-year-old widow probably would have never been killed. Also, if she didn't stay friends with him after he divorced her daughter, that would probably have helped. But she did, and people found that weird. So there had to be something at play, right? Maybe Scherer trusted her so much he stored his 100 grand floats there. Ex-cons Emmett Perkins, John True, and Jack Santos think that and they plan to take it. Barbara Graham joins the group to be their key into the door. Mabel takes a while to open up, but Barbara persuades her with the story of a broken down car and pleas for the phone. Mabel was reluctant, but the young woman was alone and the widow knew firsthand how scary it could be for a woman to be on her own at night, so she let her in. And in comes John True, Jack, Emmett, wearing rubber masks. We're gonna take a pause. Ladies and female presenters, our own sex does not guarantee our safety and you can't predict anyone's intentions. Please trust your gut if it says don't open that door. Mabel is struck on the head, left gagged and bleeding in the hallway. The group ransacks her home for a safe that never exists and panic when there is none, so they just leave her there. Mabel is dead for two days in her home before she's found. The investigation into the slaying of the Burbank widow began and it was a long one, filled with drama. In the end, the four are charged with conspiracy to commit burglary, robbery, and M-word on June 3rd, 1953, in the death of Miss Mabel Monahan. To start us off, it doesn't matter if I'm dead or alive, you should invite me. Number 10 is Skeletal Dinner Guest. For my people who hate to feel discluded, you'd probably love the members of the Postmortem Club. All members were present when they held their annual breakfast meeting, including club president J.M. McAdoo, who had died the previous year. You'll see in the photo presiding president Oakley Smith, club members, and the skeleton of Mr. McAdoo gathered together for breakfast with the skeleton at the head of the table. One of the rules of the club is that each member will will his or her skeleton to it for attendance to the club despite death. They even gave him a cigarette as you can see because smoking can't kill you if you're a skeleton. Number 9 is human depravity at its finest, the Stanford Prison Experiment. University professor Philip Zimbardo's execution of a power imbalance study in a prison ended disastrously. The Stanford Prison Experiment commenced on August 14th of 1971 with student volunteer groups comprising of 11 guards and 10 prisoners to see how they would behave on their own inside of a fabricated prison. The goal was to assess how quickly and intensely even educated or normal people can turn into cruel or sadistic ones under the right conditions. And man, was it fast. Six days in, Philip had to call off the experiment as guards were increasingly abusive to the inmates, spraying them with fire extinguishers, forcing them to clean toilets barehanded, denying them food, or just simply beating on them. The inmates and few guards who were visible minorities faced the worst treatment out of everyone. The study and the eerie photos of it inside left behind a chilling look at what humans are capable of. A killer's plea is number eight. All right, so obviously someone who takes other people's lives shouldn't get to plea anything, but in the case of the 1946 lipstick killer, their plea wasn't one for freedom or for mercy. At a Chicago crime scene, the perpetrator used lipstick to write on the wall, quote, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill, I cannot control myself. This message may actually sound kind of familiar. It's because TV shows including Criminal Minds, Castle, Law and Order, and so many more have actually taken inspiration from this image and its written message for varying episodes. The man who had written this message, William Hirons, gets his wish as he's caught soon after. He was convicted and at the time of Hirons death in 2012, he'd been locked up for approximately 66 years, making him the longest serving inmate in the USA. William's message is a reminder that not all those who commit heinous crimes are in their right of mind and sometimes they have no ability to control their actions. While it's not an excuse, it is an explanation. In our number 7 spot today we have the Tsar Bomba. This is a photo that was taken on October 30th, 1961. It was quite the Halloween spooky fright 
late that year as this is said to be the largest and most powerful nuclear weapon ever created and tested. The hydrogen aerial bomb was developed in the Soviet Union by a group of nuclear physicists that were under the leadership of Igor Kurchatov. The bomb was dropped by parachute and was detonated autonomously. While this test was meant to be a secret, turned out to be less than well kept, as it was obviously a huge explosion that was detected by United States intelligence agencies. A secret US recon aircraft called Speed Light Alpha was there monitoring the explosion and it got so close that it had its anti-radiation paint absolutely scorched off. The photo clearly shows the bomb as it exploded and it is said that this bomb was 5,000 times stronger than the ones that were dropped on Japan during World War II. That's not to say that those ones weren't strong because they were absolutely devastating, it's just an example to show how large this one really was. In our number 6 spot today we have the Three Jacksons. On August 21st, 1934, three fearless acrobats known as the Three Jacksons, Charlie Smith, Jewel Waddick, and Jimmy Kerrigan all performed a routine on the edge of the Empire State Building, which is when this photo was captured. It is said that these three toured as an acrobatic trio, and this stunt the photo captured was done at 1,245 feet. According to officials from the Empire State Building, it is said that this was the first time the stunt was attempted, and to this day, it has never been done again, which makes a lot of sense. While this photo is absolutely incredible and is such a testament not only to the trust that they shared but also their abilities as acrobats, I don't know who in their right mind would try to recreate this. We already have one, I think we can just all be happy with that. In our number 5 spot today we have the Gentleman of Rehi. This photo shows the Gentleman of Rehi and that is not a gentleman and instead is the world's oldest surviving diving suit. It is an absolutely terrifying sight but also an important pillar that allowed for this kind of technology to develop Develop to what it is today. The suit date back to the early 18th century, but it came to find its home at the Rehi Museum during the 1860s after it was donated. The suit was initially designed to allow people the ability to check the hull of ships without having to bring them into dry dock. The old gentleman is made mostly of leather with pitch thread used to stitch the seams. From here, the suit is sealed with more pitch, and then to create the waterproof coat, it is covered in a mixture of mutton tallow, tar, and pitch. Of course, underwater pressure increases increases dramatically, and this is why there's also wooden framework in the hood in order to keep it from collapsing under the pressure. At the top of the hood there is an opening for a wooden air pipe. The air would be pumped to the diver, then it could be released from the suit through a pipe on the backside. Of course, this means that the suit wasn't completely watertight, so divers could only go under for a short period and couldn't dive very deep because there was only so much pressure the suit could take, but still, the suit was far better than having no suit at all. In our number 4 spot today we have ectoplasm. This photo is said to have been taken in 1910 and it shows a medium in the middle of a spiritual seance. I don't know about you, but a 1910 seance sounds like an absolutely terrifying time. This photo is said to be catching the moment that ectoplasm appears out of the mouth of the medium. When we're talking about the occult and the paranormal, ectoplasm is a viscous substance that exudes from a spiritual entity or sometimes the earthbound medium who is connected to or communicating with the spirit. It is said that this substance can take the shape of a face or a hand or a complete body and it's usually seen in a darkened room during a sort of seance, and this is the way that the paranormal can physically manifest themselves in our world. So basically, what I'm saying is that this is supposed to be the moment that an evil entity is making themselves known in our world. Thankfully, at the end of the contact with the spirit, the ectoplasm will usually disappear as it returns to the entity, so it hopefully didn't stay around long, but this photo sure is something. In our number 3 spot today we have the isolator. There are tons of strange inventions from the past. We have entire lists and videos dedicated to the strange inventions, there's so many. And while this is one that can be added to the list of bizarre inventions, it can also be added to the list of creepy ones as well. This photo shows what was meant to be a sort of anti-distraction contraption from the 1920s. Listen. I can get easily distracted, so sometimes I need a little help, but this thing really takes it to a new level. It essentially makes it impossible for the person to look at anything other than what is directly in front of them, or you know, breathe. It seems like a contraption that requires an oxygen tank hookup probably isn't going to be the best anti-distraction device. In fact, I think that's probably more distracting than anything. Honestly, I'm such a good procrastinator that even with this thing, I still wouldn't get my work done. Thankfully, this device didn't stick around or gain much popularity, and now it is just a terrifying relic of the past. In our number 2 spot today, we have the Great Manta. In 1933, a New York silk manufacturer named A.L. Kahn was on a nice little vacation 
vacation in Florida when he honestly accidentally caught something remarkable. His anchor line, by mistake, caught onto a giant manta ray. After a struggle and several hours, Khan was able to get this actually enormous fish ashore. This monster was somewhere between 5,000 to 6,000 pounds and was 20 feet and 5 inches in width. For reference, there are other giant manta rays, but they usually grow to be around 13 to 14 feet wide, not 20 and a half. This photo is showing a taxidermy version of the fish, which Khan used to bring around to exhibitions to show off his accidental cash. In an article from December 10th, 1933 of the St. Louis Post Dispatches Sunday Magazine, Khan is quoted as saying, fishing is a lot of fun when you catch the fish, and sometimes it's fun even when you don't, but when the fish catches you. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the advertisement. This is a photo that comes to us from the time of World War II, and it shows a very terrifying kind of ad. The sign reads, these men didn't take their adabrine. And at first, I had absolutely no idea what that was. Turns out that adabrine was actually the first synthetic form of a drug which was used by the US military to fight malaria in the South Pacific during the war. It is estimated that as many as two thirds of the troops fell ill with malaria. This sign is said to have been posted outside of a military hospital in New Guinea and was meant to serve as a warning for those who didn't take the medicine, warning that the skulls on top would be the fate that awaited them. Perhaps a little dark, but creative and likely effective nonetheless. At the very least, the ad is definitely quite clear. First up is captured in a card. Alrighty, so you see this basketball card here. So centered, we've got Mark Jackson back in 89 playing a Knicks game, but over here in the far left background, we have familiar faces of Lyle and Eric Mendez. In 1990, the Mark Jackson NBA hoops card went into circulation, a year after the two Mendez brothers depicted in the background killed their parents for life insurance in August of 1989. The brothers claimed a massive payout that allowed them to live a luxurious lifestyle, spending money on expensive watches, clothes, and cars. Among the items that they bought were tickets to a basketball game at Madison Square Garden, where they would eventually be immortalized on an NBA card. To make it a little creepier, logistically, this moment captured would have been between when they killed their parents and when they were arrested. Speaking of sports, there's such a thing as the wrong time to cheer, which is our next photo. See, this is Mike Hawthorne and Ivor Webb celebrating with champagne after winning the 24H Le Mans. Look at the revelry and the glory between these men. Those around them have a completely different vibe, however. We've got an arrangement of meme expressions going on here. Homeboy in the back holding the book is giving a hell of a judgmental side eye, and we have a signature auntie are you serious expression going on. See, while these men are ecstatically celebrating their win, what isn't captured in this photo was that the raceway was covered in ambulances and fire trucks. Hawthorne had driven an opponent off the track and the resulting accident killed 84 people, most of which were spectators. Videos of this event on YouTube are kinda insane to watch, not even because of the crash or the arrogance of the winners, but the announcer is so painfully cheery it's out of place, using an old timely projection system to shout, oh women and Children are dying, whole families are wiped out, but most of the finishing cars were British, a fine achievement in this abhorrent tragedy. It feels like a fever dream. Mountain climb to heaven is next. Because if you climb Mount Everest, let's be realistic, all you're doing is making your inevitable trip to heaven a little shorter of a distance upwards, giving yourself and the creator a little shortcut, you know? Alright, so this photo has the same visual quality as some loosely scattered cat litter, but I'm sure you can make out that we've got these silly little tents here, man look how far tents have come, as well as these two dudes and what it looks like high socks. This is the 1924 British Mount Everest expedition. We've talked about a few Mount Everest climber groups and things that have happened to them in a few of our videos, so you may be familiar with this one from our channel. That or literally any Mount Everest movie. They tend to either pick one specific story to document or mismatch all of them together for one plot and then throw Jake Gyllenhaal up on a mountain. Anyways, this photo was taken of George Mallory and Sandy Irvin shortly after they made their ill-fated attempt to get to the summit. While Mallory's body is found literally decades later in 1999, the body of Irvin never has been. Number 7 is the sacrifice of Michael Rockefeller. Michael Rockefeller was the son of New York governor and soon to be US Vice President Nelson Rockefeller and he famously disappeared in Papua New Guinea in 1960s. This photo is of his first trip there. Rockefeller can be seen centered and smiling as indigenous people circle and run around him. Michael is known for his travels, he loved to visit the unexplored and untouched areas of society and learn about cultures many considered primitive. He's 
saw the art and beauty in them. This hit Desire for Adventure took Rockefeller to the remote reaches of Papua New Guinea in 1961. They arrived near the island of Dutch on November 19th and even though they were 12 miles from shore, Rockefeller reportedly told anthropologist Rene Wassing, I think I can make it and jumped into the water and headed for land and was never seen again. It's believed at first that he drowned but Rockefeller had done a swim like that to shore actually multiple times. Because he was a member of a super rich American dynasty, there was a massive search. Ships, airplanes, helicopters, everything combed the region for any sign of him. They found nothing. National Geographic reporter Carl Hoffman offered a far more disturbing thesis than drowning in his 2014 book, Savage Harvest. The island Rockefeller swam to was inhabited by the Asmid, an uncontacted and primarily unfriendly indigenous clan. Hoffman claims to have uncovered evidence showing that Rockefeller made it to land where he was then decapitated by the Asmat people before they ceremonially him, eating his brain and using his bones likely to make weaponry and other items. The confusing unanswered end of Rockefeller air has since been debated, but it will always remain unsolved sadly. Number 6 is we're leaving on a UFO. Not as catchy as a jet plane, but Marshall Applewhite was told by aliens it was a UFO indefinitely. So Marshall had been told a lot of things by the aliens, as had his wife before her passing. Affectionately self dubbed as T and Doe after the musical scales, they believed themselves to be of the highest caliber, like T and Doe are on the scale. The cult these two began, Heaven's Gate, is famously recognized for the tragic mass departure members took on March 26 of 1997. It's on that day that the 39 members of the cult were convinced to consume a mixture of barbiturates and applesauce and then washed it down with vodka as one member walked around to each poisoned person and tied bags over their heads to ensure asphyxiation. This mass taking of life was discovered days later when panicked family members of cult members hadn't heard from them. One former member went to go find his beloved wife and well I'm sure you can imagine what he found. What was confusing for many was to find the group covered in purple shrouds with their feet sticking out. They wore Nike sneakers with the classic white swoop. They believed these wings were going to carry them to the heavens. Countless photos were taken by FBI and police, most of which have been leaked to public by now and depict this very scene that I'm describing. Confusing and devastating, this loss was in international news and a reminder to always be aware of your own susceptibility to influence. Number 5 is the frozen man of Mount Everest. And yeah, yeah, I get it. We all know that there's tons of frozen bodies along Mount Everest, but that's that's not what I'm actually talking about this time. The photo you'll see is of mountain climber Beck Weathers, who in May of 1996 attempted to complete the final leg of the ascent on Everest. Despite how short the distance was, the journey caught up to Beck, and he came down with a case of snow blindness during an intense blizzard that had a wind chill of 100 degrees below zero, and he fell into a hypothermic coma. Initially, I thought I was in a dream, Weathers later recalled. Then I saw how badly frozen my right hand was, and that helped bring me around to reality. Beck was left for dead, first by his exhibition and then the second time by a rescue crew doctor who believed him beyond saving. So it's only by miracle that Beck manages to break a hypothermic coma, turn around and walk back to base camp. When he reaches camp, Beck is airlifted immediately as frostbite set in on his nose and hands, both of which are later amputated. This moment is caught in photograph and shows the frozen hand and Beck visibly unconscious being carried in a red sleeping bag. This ascent to Everest is remembered as the 1996 Mount Everest disaster and is famously covered in John Krakauer's book Thin Air and and its 1997 adaption as well as films Everest and Everest 2015. So by the way, they prematurely told Beck's wife and family he had passed away. Can you imagine that emotional roller coaster? Number 4 is the Maori Trophy Heads. The native Maori of New Zealand had a cultural practice of preserving severed heads of enemies for trophy and warning purposes. They are called mokamokai and these heads were processed by first of course getting chopped off but then boiled, smoked and sun dried. The Maori would then coat them in shark oil to prevent cracking and peeling before mounting them. When British colonizers invaded the land during the 1840s, the Maori heads were one of the famously pillaged artifacts and treasures of the colonial era. Major General Horatio Gordon Robley was in service for the British Army when they were invading and pillaging New Zealand in the 1960s. He was particularly enthralled by the Maori heads and the absolute piece of you know what actually stole 35 of them for his own collection. You can see him in this photo sitting at the base of a wall with Maori heads mounted upon it. Naturally like most of what was stolen by British colonialists for the crown and or for themselves, these items were never returned to their rightful peoples and instead earned profit in British museums or collect dust in storerooms. Since the 1970s, New Zealand has had a strong record of requesting those remains back from overseas. The first major international reparation of a toy moko happened in 1985, and in 2003, New Zealand created its first government funded international reparations program. It's now seen the return of 800 Maori and Moriori remains. Number three is the Rur Cannibal Demonstration, an image caught by police officers as the Rur 
himself. Joaquin Kroll reenacts one of the crimes after his capture. Kroll was very particular about how he killed and only doing so in the same place on a few occasions and years apart. This and the fact of the number of other killers operating in the area at the time, it helped him evade capture. This killer started in 1955 and didn't stop for two decades until his capture. He's known to have taken 14 lives without any rhyme or reason, no preference for age, gender, race, status, everyone was on the table. Pun intended unfortunately, as Kroll wasn't just necrophilic with the bodies, he ate them too. After taking their lives and using their bodies, he would bring home pieces to cook. He was finally caught in 1976 after police discovered intestines from one of his victims clogging the plumbing of the apartment building. Police reported that when a neighbor had asked Kroll about them and if he had knew what had backed up the pipes earlier, Kroll simply replied, guts. Why the police felt the need to reenact his crime photos I'm not sure, but the result is several photos of Kroll propped over a volunteer in the park looking full of ecstasy and primal delight that will send a shiver down your spine. Number 2 is the tragic death of cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov. So imagine knowing you're going to die but still walking aboard. That is what the Soviet astronaut Vladimir did on April 23rd 1967. The craft had shown countless issues and flaws during testing to an extent where it wasn't even just just Vladimir who knew this was going to happen. It was everyone working the project. So why did it go forward despite clear danger? No one was willing to back out and risk the fury or disappointment of the Soviet high command. So Vladimir could have backed out himself, but it would have doomed the next astronaut to be put on the project, who happened to be his close friend, Yuri Gargan. So he was assigned to the mission and he decided he would do it and spare anyone else. Upon re-entry to Earth, the tragedy happens. The craft's parachute fails and the Soyuz craft hurtled to Earth at unthinkable speeds, burning Vladimir alive inside. Photos of the craft were taken after its impact showing a horrific scene of melted plastics, metal and char. He became the first human to ever die in space flight and Vladimir himself was so confident this would be the case that he asked for an open casket funeral that would force his superiors to see what they had done to him. And so the second famous photo of this incident is taken, Vladimir's superiors standing over the mangled bunch of melted and charred human bones with nauseated horror in their gaze. And so in at number 1 is what's considered the creepiest photo ever taken by the internet? Broken Blanche Monnier. This is a real life horror story. Blanche is born in 1849 and starts life living lavishly and beloved in her prominent French family home, ingrained with ideas of Prince Charming and happily ever afters. She remains unmarried into her 20s however and searches desperately for her true love so she may move away from her domineering mother. It's in 1874 that her wish is granted and she meets an older man of status and intends to marry him. But mama disagrees and she's not feeling he's suitable and she needs someone else. Blanche is furious. He can support her. He's high class, a lawyer. That's everything her mother demanded she finds and she finally found it. Blanche finally put her foot down against her mother and her mother makes her regret it for decades to come. Blanche is locked away in the attic closet. There are no windows and only a hay mattress. Once a day her mother would cram dinner scraps under the doorway for her to eat. Blanche's mother reminds her every day that if she gives up on her betrothed she would free Blanche. Blanche refuses every time even after her fiance unbeknownst to her passes away in 18 85 while she's still imprisoned. It wouldn't have mattered however, the public had been told by her mother that Blanche had been dead since she locked her away in 1874, so everyone just thought that was the case. Blanche meanwhile survived 16 years in this closet until an anonymous note to police by a maid forces authorities to search the home. They find Blanche, now middle aged, malnourished, covered in sores and fecal matter, surrounded by vermin and rot. This moment is caught on film by police. You'll see Blanche sitting on her bed, an excited yet lost expression on her face. Her mother and brother were both charged in her mother very quickly and deservedly dies in prison while her brother manages to appeal and escape justice. Blanche is left a shell of a person from 16 years of solitary and dark confinement. She spent the rest of her life in a psychiatric care at one of the state's best hospitals, the sole heir to her mother's precious fortune and status. Number 10, The Cube. All right, Transformers fans, let's do this. I feel like we're hearing more about these things like UFOs or UAPs, whatever you want to call them now. I feel like we're hearing about them now more than ever. So why not kick this weird list off with something awesome? Off world. We have to include some alien cover ups, right? It's me, it's Taylor, why not? I figured that I'd find one that's also not too well known. We haven't seen this one, you know on YouTube all the time. Not too long ago, this spinning cube looking craft or drone or something, it was spotted over Missouri, just lurking in the same spot, just hovering. And then it would zoom off. Folks could see it with their naked eye on the ground. It was also pretty obvious. It was eye grabbing, it was shiny in the sky. Only a couple hours later, it was seen again, but this time it was 700 miles away. This time it was 44 year old Matthew Jandeka. He was minding his own business, hanging out on the porch, just doing his you know Sunday, Sunday stuff. When this cube, again, this 
this floaty cube caught his attention. It was a sunny day, the light reflecting off the cube caught his eye, but then a day later, another guy, 30-year-old Justin Johnson, he saw the same thing, but this time he saw it while he was driving home, which is also pretty distracting. The light and the reflections also caught his eye. He says, at first I thought maybe it was a balloon, but the movements were too odd. In a world full of deep fakes, I mean, do we believe this account? Is this real? Lately, everyone's talking about how these UFOs are spheres, so maybe this video is that of a sphere. Not a cube, that's cool. I love teaching geometric shapes via alien aircraft. I'm like, this is a triangle. We saw this one in the Navy, then we saw this cube in the sky. Number nine, Amityville photo. Okay, we'll go less UFOs, more ghosts. One M. Night Shyamalan theme to the other, here we go. This photo was taken inside the actual Amityville house back in 1976. It's a young man, it appears, with glowing white eyes. How comforting is that? Pretty, pretty hard to miss there, he's got the glowing Yep, yeah, looks very Sin City of him, just to stare with his white eyes. Now, at first, I thought this was from a horror movie, right? All those Amityville knockoffs. It looks obviously fake or set up in some way, until you start to read about the details here. See, this photo, it was taken with automatic cameras equipped with infrared, not an actual person. So, this young lad here probably wasn't expecting a selfie. Why I wasn't smiling or throwing up a peace sign. Makes sense now. Photographer Gene Campbell set up the photo and took it back in 1976. Now, at the time, Gene was working with paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren on the actual case. Huh. I'm scared now. This photo was revealed three years after it was taken on the Merv Griffin show, and many believe this is the ghost of John DeFeo, one of the victims in 1974. Now, you can't really do this anymore, right? You can't whip out photos from a otherwise crime scene and be like, okay gang, what do we think? Spirit or not a spirit? Vote, yes, no. Obviously there was backlash after this for obvious reasons, but it took three years for that photo to reach the public eye, and now everybody believes in ghosts, or they do a little more than they did before that show. This was long before The Conjuring movie as well, obviously, so this was quite random to see on TV. Do you believe in ghosts? What's the ratio here? Comment down below. I'm not a believer, I'm not gonna lie. I've tried numerous times. I got the Ouija board, did the whole thing. Felt nothing, man. Like an 18 year old on Christmas. I'm like, is that it? Is it done? Do I have to feel anything anymore? Number eight, Alfred Hitchcock and the MGM Lion. All right, you're gonna hear me roar after this one. This photo was from 1958. You've seen this at some point, right? Hopefully, or else, you know, we'll send over a VHS, we'll help you out. It was taken by Clarence Sinclair Bull. Now the photo appears to be, well, no, it doesn't appear to be at all. It's Alfred Hitchcock serving tea to a lion. Yeah, the famous MGM lion. His name's Leo, that's him, there he goes, he's getting tea. He loves suspense and tea, who would have thought? And company, it appears. North by Northwest was the only film that Hitchcock did with MGM. So there's a rumor now that he directed the lion's roar for the MGM intro, which is fun. But you're also like, okay, that's a real animal, that's kinda, that's sad. And also, that's probably nonsense. There have been seven MGM lions in total. Yeah, not just one. But Leo was known to be the most friendly. I wanna hear about the other six. I'm like, what happened there? He's still in the logo today, but again, back in the 1950s, it's hard to say what it was really like on set. I mean, it's still a lion being held down for a photo, so probably wasn't a friendly vibe for that fella. Our next photo is of an undeserving celebrity. Why? Because the reason he's a celebrity is so extremely twisted that it blows me away. And I don't mean an undeserving in a Kim Kardashian made a family of talentless people famous through adult video kind of way. I mean in a seriously sick, twisted, criminal, undeserving way. I'll only be calling this man IS, as I do not believe any more infamy should be granted. The photo you see was from a Japanese magazine after he was released from prison due to insanity. IS killed Dutch-born Renee Harvel and the two were studying in Saborn, Paris. He chose to do this because of her health and her beauty characteristics that he felt he lacked. IS considered himself weak, ugly, and small and claimed he wanted to absorb her energy through, well, he had her body for three days. I'll simply let you piece together what I mean when I say that he had a considerable amount of this body missing and a very interesting fridge contents. But like I said, he was released. So how can you kill someone whilst on a student visa, desecrate remains, and then also do some pretty horrific acts posthumously? He is from a very wealthy Japanese family and they somehow managed to get him released. Also, they paid the victim's parents a huge sum of money for the loss. That's the world we live in. After his release, he was frequently on talk shows, reviewed restaurants for magazines, and appeared in horror films. He even wrote a book on the murder of Renee. This next photo shows us you never know what could be just a reach away. This photo 
photo looks relatively normal. Now obviously it's not gonna be, it's on this list and the fact that it's titled about reaching out to something, well. Sarah Funk, who you see here on the waterline, is a YouTube vlogger who's on a trip to Cyprus's Red Lake. And you can see her literally like two feet away from a suitcase lodged in the waterbed. It's two years after this photo is taken in 2019 that the drifting suitcase is retrieved and opened to reveal the corpse of a girl. She is one of seven known victims of serial killer Nikos Mexata, whose signature was doing body dumps in suitcases. It's believed the reason this case was retrieved in the first place was due to previous sightings of it in the water once other victims of Nikos had started to be found and identified at the same time period. Sarah Funk has since commented on what it's like to know that she was so close to a body without being aware. I thought it was a log at the time, but in retrospect, I realized it wasn't. This is a completely fair explanation. As you can see from that picture, the case was incredibly dirty and hard to identify even as a briefcase. This man is the first recorded serial killer on the island of Cyprus and is currently serving seven life sentences in central prison. Our next photo is recreating time, pun is intended. The photo you see on screen is very peculiar, but not the most outlandish. It's a man standing shirtless behind the fence in a summer afternoon, looking like something out of an old country family album of sorts. His name is Fikrek Alik, and he was photographed in this exact spot for a Time magazine cover back in 1992. You are quite literally looking twice with these images. Emaciated, it's almost hard to recognize him. Fikrat can be seen holding his t-shirt in one hand and reaching with his other through the barbed wire to take someone's hand. This is during the Bosnian War from 1992 to 95, and Fikrat was one of many prisoners held in camps at the time. This recreation of the Time magazine cover was taken in the mid 2000s, and the building behind him now is a community center without any plaques or memorials of the victims of the notorious prisoner camps in Bosnia. This region is now under the rule of the same faction that was responsible for the camp, so they engage in a lot of historical denials and concealing. Fikret's story remains one of incredible perseverance, especially as he and other victims still go before the UN today in battle to have reparations and acknowledgement. This vintage photo isn't so vintage, but it's old enough, so I'm counting it. It's bad Santa. This early 2000s family Christmas photo reps a normal looking scene. White picket fence family, the itchy velvet Christmas dresses, the big sparkly tree, and the serial killer Santa. That there is Bruce MacArthur. In the warm seasons, he is a landscaper, but working in the Agincourt Mall as Santa during the holidays. Between 2010 and 2017, he terrorized the gay village district of Toronto, Ontario. Luring men in through dating apps, he killed and disposed of eight individuals in the planter boxes of properties he managed. For a long time in the community, people had known someone was taking gay men off the street, but the Toronto police were resistant in believing something was suspicious. I remember myself seeing posts on Reddit and Twitter mere months after the first of the disappearances, frustrated with the lack of police action and urging the community members to stay alert. It takes multiple victims and community engagement for police to start an investigation and it's thankfully in the nick of time. They'd been watching Bruce for a while before his arrest when they saw a young man enter his place. After about a half hour of nothing, they decide to make the risk to move in for an arrest. When they entered the unit, the young man was tied up and unconscious and they caught Bruce in the act. No way to plead guilty, my guy. He's found guilty of eight counts of first degree murder. Our next vintage photo is one that speaks to a still in modern times, a determined mother. This photo was taken on Mother's Day. The woman in it is Margie, a 23 year old, and she's holding her infant son while attempting to hitchhike. As you can see, it was printed in a newspaper column and has a subject line describing Margie's struggle with her husband Mike to find an apartment. I imagine that struggle alongside the fact that she is hitchhiking likely correlates with financial difficulties. Unfortunately, Margie's luck never got better. This is very likely the last photo of Margie alive. Less than four months later, she was killed by her husband Mike during a fight. In the time between this photo and her demise, their son Brandon had been taken away and put into foster care, where he was later adopted by his foster parents after Margie's sudden death. Little information exists on the photo other than this, and on what Brandon's life became. This is still recent enough history that some may recognize the story, the manifesto man. This photo seems so simple. A man appears to be in a wetsuit, he has multiple police badges displayed, and he sits in a stoic manner. This is no cop. In fact, this photo was taken after his arrest in July of 2011 for killing 77 people and injuring 250. Anders Behring had a manifesto for killing political enemies as a far right extremist, first killing 8 people outside the tower block housing of the office of the prime minister. The method used caused distraction, enough for Anders slipping away in a police disguise to pull part 2 of his plan, which is hop in the ocean and swim to political youth swing summer camp just starting the season. He chose the summer camp for the politicians who came to visit the camp, which was for members of political youth adult clubs and organizations for co-ops, school courses, or just special interest in politics. Once on the island, well, he opened fire. Many who were afraid and unsure of where the danger was coming from went towards Anders for safety.
safety due to his police costume and received the opposite. His verbalized intent that day was to kill everyone he could and thankfully he did not succeed. But some swam away and were rescued by people staying at campgrounds across the water who brought out boats to pull everyone out. Others hid in various places on the island. Netflix released the film 22nd of July about this event in Oslo and the movies White Rage and Brave Hearts also tell the story. Ultimately this event only took place due to Anders racist ideology, believing Norwegian politicians were lenient on immigrants. Let's talk about the most disastrous hostage crisis our world might have ever seen, the Gladbeck hostage bus. The 1988 crisis in Gladbeck, Germany was the kind of disaster you don't see often. In this photo you'll see a robber left and a hostage right taken on the last day of the situation. Day 1, two dudes rob a bank and take some hostages. They demand a getaway car and took two hostages and then stopped for one of the robber's sisters casually on the way as reporters follow. Day 2, the same robbers hijack a bus with 32 passengers. Whilst holding out in the bus they allow reporters some entry to interview them. One robber even came outside the bus for an interview like an MTV crib situation but with hostages. The robbers state that their stance is that they don't care what happens because they'd simply take their own lives anyway if it all went wrong. Obviously this is a sign for police to maybe, I don't know, handle with a lot of caution. And like tossing stones at glass houses, caution was non-existent. When the robbers take off in the bus, once again followed by police and reporters just doing nothing, the robber's sister is arrested by police at the first gas station they stop at. Her arrest causes the robbers to lash out and kill a hostage so the police release her and go back to doing nothing. After this, the road trip crosses jurisdictions into Netherlands. The Dutch police are now involved and they demand the release of any young hostages on board with the promise of a BMW in return. The robbers took two hostages with them in the BMW and drove back to Germany. Later on, they were surrounded by a lot of media reporters who took a lot of pictures of the scene which can be found in Google. That is where our photo of the hostage and the robber was taken. Finally, the German police after days of this make a move that isn't just following the robbers like a lost puppy. They rammed the hostage car, causing a crash. One of the hostages flees off the highway as police and robbers engage their firearms. The woman in our photo, Silky Bischoff, is sadly caught in the crossfire. The driving robber said later in an interview that the bullets came from a policeman, but the German police denies that and says that the bullets came from the robbers and hit the hostage. No matter what, the one thing I can say about this whole story is what the f was anyone trying to accomplish here? Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a stratovolcano located in Skamania County, Washington. This volcano is best known for its huge and disastrous eruption on May 18, 1980. This photograph comes from photographer Robert Landsberg, who of course was in the area at the time of the eruption. Before the eruption, he had visited the area in order to photograph and document all of the changes that were happening. On May 18th, he was within a few miles of the volcano when it erupted. Since he unfortunately was located so close to the explosion, he knew he would be unable to escape this disaster, so instead of focusing on the impossible, he focused on taking as many pictures as possible. Robert was obviously incredibly brave and dedicated, but also very smart. After snapping as many photos as he could, including this one, he then secured his camera in his backpack and covered his backpack with his body. He knew he was unlikely to survive but wanted to make sure that these photos did. His body was found 17 days later with his backpack still underneath him. His film was of course, um, his film was of course developed and has provided geologists with some really valuable insights with his close documentation of the eruption. In our number 9 spot today we have The Core. This photo shows a physicist named Harold Agnew and while this looks like a relatively normal non-threatening photo, what he has in his hand is truly devastating. Harold is holding the nuclear core of what was nicknamed the Fat Man Atomic Bomb. This means that Harold is holding the nuclear core of the atomic bomb that was later dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The immediate blast of course took many lives, but so did the long term effects of the bomb, like radiation illness and that sort of thing. It's crazy to look at a photo like this because it seems just so perfectly normal when he literally has a life changing, world ending device in the palm of his hand. Also I don't think I could ever hold something like that. Not only would I just like not want to, but I would just be so afraid that something was gonna go wrong. 
In our number eight spot today, we have the Challenger Crew. This is a photo that was taken of the clearly very excited Challenger crew as they walked down the ramp, ready to head off on their mission. The crew even included 37-year-old Krista McAuliffe, who was a high school social studies teacher. She had won a spot on this mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space Program, and she had trained diligently for months in order to be the first non-military person in space. On January 28th, 1986, the Challenger mission proved to be fatal just 70 three seconds after liftoff. Two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures of the morning, and on live television, the world watched as the spacecraft broke apart and plunged into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everyone on board. It is an absolutely tragic event, made even more chilling by this final photo. Number seven, Gloria Steinem. Oh, here we go, a scandalous one. Back in 1963, the Playboy Club in New York City was booming. It was one of Hugh Hefner's greatest accomplishments at the time. This club was the talk of the town, that is until Gloria Steinem came in and started reporting some stuff. Gloria was a feminist writer, she's an icon, she created Miss Magazine back in 1972, but her career began much earlier around the 60s. See she got a job as one of these playboy bunnies, you know. Must be a comfortable get up. And she worked at the club undercover, secretly taking note on how this key holders only <sighs> establishment was operating, right? Cool, what's going on in here? What's the big scoop here? The staff were these young women, these beautiful young women, these bunnies. They had to wear the black bodysuits, the puffy white tails, the whole get up. And at age 28, Gloria worked undercover there for three weeks straight. And the piece she released after, appropriately titled A Bunny's Tale, Great title, by the way, she nailed that one. It got so much attention that it kickstarted her freelance career and also made her a feminist icon. This photo of Gloria undercover shows you the comfortable work outfits she had to endure just to get the story out. Yeah, doesn't look like she had her non-slips on there. That's, that's a write-up in my books. In a collection of her writings, Gloria reflects on the undercover piece, saying that it now has outlived all of the Playboy clubs, both here and abroad. That was before Hefner passed away in 2017, so I will add that you also outlived him as well. Good, he wasn't a very nice lad. Let's move on. Number six, North Sentinel Island. All right, we've got some people, some aliens, some ghosts. What else do we need, Taylor? How about some weird islands? Sure. North Sentinel Island. We gotta head over to India for this one. This island is the home of the Sentinelese tribe. You've probably heard about this at some point. One of the most forbidden islands in the world, but why? Located in the Bay of Bengal, North Sentinel Island is about 1,200 kilometers away from India. And while most islands are shrinking, this one actually grew back in 2014. Yeah, the universe is like more. Yeah, you need more of this, sure. The island lifted up a couple of meters during an earthquake, so the west and south sides, they gained an extra kilometer. Nice. DLC unlocked. The inhabitants on this island are among the few uncontacted tribes left in the world. They have apparently been there for 50,000 years, and there's no sign of agriculture or even fire. Yet somehow this tribe has thrived for ages. Now, if we try and get close, they will try and drive anybody away. More than fair, like we have enough room, we're good. Let's just leave. In fact, back in 2006, two fishermen sadly lost their lives because they got too close to the island without knowing who was on it or what the island was. Yeah, you can't just approach random islands. You gotta do some homework. That's why I'm here. Number five, Lascaux Cave. If you didn't visit this cave back in 1963 or sooner, well, you lost your chance because, well, humans ruin everything. Now we can't even see ancient art anymore because, well, it's too many of us. The Lascaux Cave system is now a World Heritage Site in France, but once it was a booming tourist attraction. These cave paintings, see, they're 17,300 years old. They're quite ancient. We can't really touch them. You can't have someone write Steve was here on it. Can't do that. Paintings that depict cattle, bison, stags, you name it. They're beautiful, they're complex, and of course, like I said, they're extremely old. So old, in fact, that the cave was closed to the public forever in 1963 after it declared human presence wasn't healthy for the art. Yeah, our dirty coffee breath would eventually cause this art to fade away, so we had to hold our breath. We gotta leave. We gotta close it off. There we go. Plus, I'm sure somebody would have snuck in with a sharpie by now and ruined it. You know what I mean? Or like graffiti. It would have been gone by now. You know it. 7,000 year old paintings. Yeah, protect these for another 17,000 years, please. Number four, Surtsey Island. Another fun island. Another weird story. Here we go. When it comes to new things in life, it's pretty rare that we get a new island, right? Especially on our planet when we're losing things and melting. How lucky are we? Sure. We're even luckier that Disney didn't build a resort here first because now scientists, now they get a chance to study what an island looks like without human interaction. That's a fun little project to focus on in the future. That's cool. It's pretty cool. It's weird and scary, but it's cool, I guess. Yeah, kind of nervous. I don't know. Surtsey Island in Iceland, as of right now, it's only open to a few scientists and geologists. Everybody else, 
beat it. Go find your own island. Get out of here. It was born from a volcanic eruption back in 1963, and scientists, they have one rule on this island. Don't talk about Fight Club. And the second rule is no seeds. Yeah, no life. No chance at life at all. Choose something else, anything else, please. One guy accidentally pooped out a tomato seed and he almost ruined the whole operation. The guy almost ruined his entire plan. What a stressful job. It's so eerie to see the oldest human history and then immediately after see a new island where humans are forbidden. It's like, we're not allowed to go and be places anymore. I'm kind of uh, not, that's not great. What are we doing here? I'm just breathing on things. I can't take a sh on this island? Number three, Spaceman. Look, we've all been photobombed before. It's a blessing in disguise. You look back at prom photos, some dude's trying to do a moonwalk in between, his face is like melting this way. It's great, you're like, ah, classic Jeff. It's the best. But when Jim Templeton took a photo of his daughter in a otherwise empty marsh long before Photoshop existed, and yet somehow there appears to be an astronaut in the background, well, that's not very fun, is it? That's a little bit concerning. Jim assures us that nobody was around when this photo was taken, which I of course believe, because why would you put your kid in a photo with whatever that is? That's, no, no thank you, it's not a weird, we're not gonna go and talk to that guy. Also, the fact that this man looks like he's from space. That ought to do it, that makes him more weird and believable. What are we looking at right now? I have no idea. Kodak even got involved in the story, like, Kodak. Not Kodak Black, like the company. They got involved. They confirmed this photo was not tampered with. Yeah, and that's Kodak, right? They don't lie about anything. Spider-Man leak, Kodak's like, nah, it's Andrew Garfield. Don't listen to that. So authentic, can't confirm. Number two, nursing home spirit. This photo was taken from a nursing home resident the same night that another resident had passed away, which is an odd thing to do, just set up a camera thing right after. Like, yeah, just in case, you know, maybe we'll catch one. Well, they did. This was back in 2015, and that night they heard a door open and close, but there were no visitors allowed at the time. So, you know, some, some Kodak was coming into the picture at this point. So now there's a great amount of people who think that this image is one of two things. It's either the spirit of the resident that passed away, or it's the Grim Reaper. Yeah, the door opening and closing, People think that was the Grim Reaper coming in and then leaving, which is so scary. How long was he in there? Was it like 46 seconds, four minutes? How long does this guy operate? Is he quick? Is it like busting tables? Is he just like, all right, let's do this. Is he like Santa Claus? I feel like he's like Santa Claus. A few comments were also saying that it's comforting, this photo, to know that in the end you aren't alone, that you have someone assisting you to the um, afterlife. No, I'm good. I'd rather die alone than have uh, whatever that is break into my home and closing open doors. I'm good. And finally, number one, the Battle of Los Angeles, or lack thereof. We'll see, I don't know, this is a weird one. Of course, we have to end on one of the most unspeakable battles, photos, whatever you wanna call it, of all time. The Battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great Los Angeles Air Raid, happened during World War II, right at the end of February 1942. Now, this event, first of all, took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack, so I'll admit, everyone's a little on edge. We're a little stressed out, we've got some hands hovering over some buttons, we're a little nervous, sure. Something like 25 enemy aircraft was apparently spotted flying over Los Angeles in the late hours of February 24th. So, air raids then went off, blackouts were put in effect. This was not a drill, right? Or was it? What was this? This thing was getting lit up in the sky. Around 1,400 shells were blasted off and two people had a heart attack. That's how loud it was. In total, five people ended up dying from this retaliation and apparently it was a false alarm. Although many now believe that it was UFOs or aliens, and that's why we were launching stuff at it. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. People have heart attacks. He's like, oops, I was nervous. My bad, slipped. A little quick reaction there. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the burst of joy. You might be looking at this photo wondering how this extremely joyous photo could hold any dark secrets. Well, this photo won a Pulitzer Prize, and for a very good reason. The photo was captured by Slava Vedder on March 17th, 1973, at the track Travis Air Force Base in California. The photo shows United States Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Robert L. Sturm and his family. This was taken as he was being reunited with his family after five years of being held as a prisoner of war in North Vietnam. On October 27, 1967, he was leading a flight of F-105s when he was shot down over Hanoi and held captive until March 14, 1973. I can't imagine what this must have been like for his family because there was a chance that 
that he could have not come home at all. The girl with her arms wide open is his daughter, but the looks on all of their faces truly captures the pure joy that they are all feeling. In our number 9 spot today, we have the reflecting pool. This is one of the creepiest or chilling images ever taken. It depicts a young girl in a graveyard who is looking down at her reflection in a pond. Okay, maybe a little eerie, but not exactly chilling. What really makes this photo what it is, however, is that there are seemingly two reflections looking back up at the little girl. No one knows who the girl is, where she is, or when this photo was taken, but it is estimated to have come from somewhere around the early 1900s. The photo was analyzed, and it has been said that it is unaltered or edited. Who knows how this photo was possible? Maybe there was some sort of invisible entity standing beside her that we could only see in the reflection, like a reverse vampire or something. In our number 8 spot today, we have the neighborhood nuclear test. This photo shows a mother and her young son looking out the window and witnessing a nuclear test explosion from the comfort of their own home in 1953. Like. What? Imagine seeing that from your window now in 2023. People would be going wild. And of course, any kind of nuclear test should be done as far away from where people live as possible. I know it's not like the test was being done in their front yard or anything, but I still certainly wouldn't be comfortable with them testing a nuclear device anywhere near the place I live. This photo was of course taken before the effects of nuclear radiation from these kinds of explosions were publicly understood. Actually, people have suggested that the public knowledge knowledge of these kinds of side effects were suppressed during this time in order to avoid controversy about them testing these kinds of weapons in your neighborhood. Well, that would of course be something insane to witness firsthand. Thankfully, the now widely known health risks associated with this sort of thing has caused this to not be a common occurrence anymore. In our number 7 spot today, we have the plague. This photo comes from the 19th century, from the third plague pandemic. This was the first time that the plague had spread to all five continents. While we now know something about what that might have been like, what we haven't had to endure are the doctors that dressed like this. This is a photo of the outfits and masks that plague doctors wore when they would come to your house to treat or diagnose you. The long beak-like noses of the masks are very creepy, but they were used to hold herbs and other nicely scented things because they believed that it would help ward off the bad air, which at the time is what they thought was causing the sickness. A pandemic certainly is bad enough. Thankfully, our doctors and nurses are just sticking to scrubs. In our number 6 spot today, we have the elephant's foot. This photo looks like it's just a big lump of nothing, but it's called an elephant's foot. Don't worry, at first I was a little worried too, but it has nothing to do with elephants and is only named that because of its appearance. This lump was actually created from the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown, and it is just a mass of corium and other materials that were in the core of the reactor. This elephant's foot was located in the steam distribution corridor, which is under what's left of the reactor. While this mass doesn't produce as much radiation as it did before, it does still, to this day, produce a deadly amount. It is said that if you stood in front of it for just 300 seconds, that would be enough to get a lethal dose of radiation. It's kind of crazy that even though they knew this, they were still standing there taking pictures of it. But I'm just glad because we all now get to see it, and it gives us just a little more insight into what exactly happened that day. In our number 5 spot today, we have Mount Pinatubo. This is a photo that is showing Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines on June 15th, 1991. That is the day that this volcano erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Certainly impressive, also extremely terrifying. This photo shows the pyroclastic flow full of hot gas and rock being flung into the air. Eruptive activity in the volcano first started on April 2nd of that year, which prompted researchers to set up seismographs in the area. By June, the volcano was having a group of progressively shallower eruptions before, on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular eruption, which sent an ash column 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere. After more highly gas-charged magma reached the surface, on June 15th, the volcano once again exploded, this time sending the cloud of ash 40 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Volcanic ash and pumice blanketed the surrounding area, and pyroclastic flows filled what were once deep valleys with fresh volcanic deposits. It was truly magnificent and extremely powerful, and this photo shows just that. In our number 4 spot today, we have the Pioneer's Defense. This photo is known as the Pioneer's Defense, and 
Man, does it ever look creepy. This photo comes from 1937 and it was taken by a Russian photographer named Viktor Bulla. This photo takes place in the Leningrad area, which is now known as St. Petersburg, which is the second largest city in Russia. The people in this photo were part of a group that was the 1930s Russian equivalent of our Boy Scouts, and it was called the Young Pioneers. The masks on their faces leave a very eerie feeling, and for a fair reason. These people were doing a military preparation drill, which is the reason for the gas mask. This photo was taken during a time where the country was under the dictatorship of Joseph Stalin and the residents were constantly unsure of what was going to happen. The country was already seeing death and people were already frightened just a few years before the start of World War II. In our number 3 spot today we have the lipstick. This is a photo that comes to us from December 10th, 1945. If looking at this image gives you a shudder down your spine, that absolutely makes sense as it was written by a terrible person known as the lipstick killer. This photo is an image of a note he left written on the wall at one of his crime scenes. The photo comes from the apartment of Francis Brown, as just before he wrote this message, he took her life. After this message was left, he ended up taking the life of one other person before he was finally caught by police six months later. The message scrawled in the photo reads, quote, For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. It is an absolutely chilling note with a horrifying backstory. In our number two spot today, we have the acid drum. This photo comes to us from inside the house of another terrible person, the serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, made very famous recently. This photo was taken from the inside of his home after he was found out and caught by authorities. Before his arrest, he was sadly able to take the lives of 17 different people. Although this photo might look kind of plain, the horrors are plentiful. This shot shows a drum full of acid that was located inside of his home. Probably don't really need to tell you what it was used for. I can't imagine the horrors investigators saw when they entered his home, and even previous to that as they investigated his crimes. Thankfully, Jeffrey was caught and in 1992, he was sentenced to life in prison, but just two years later, he was killed by a fellow prison inmate. In our number one spot today, we have the Dyatlov Pass incident. If you have never heard of the Dyatlov Pass incident, you better buckle in because it is so terrifying. This photo was taken in February of 1959 as nine young Soviet hikers sent out to trek through the Ural Mountains. They had set up a camp and some Sometime during the night, something happened that made them cut their way out of the tent and all flee the site. Leaving in such a rush, they were of course underdressed for the bitterly cold weather, and six of them ended up passing away from hypothermia, which is extremely tragic. The other three, however, is where this story takes an even more frightening turn. Like I mentioned before, no one knows why they fled the tent in the first place, and the last three hikers were found passed away with severe signs of physical trauma that no one agreed on what had caused it. In 2019, the investigation was reopened, and just last year there was a conclusion that a kind of avalanche called a slab avalanche was the cause for these injuries. Before you come at me in the comments, I know that not everyone is convinced that's what happened, and I don't blame you. It's really strange. Number 10, the isolator. The last thing anybody wants to do after the almost, almost two years we've had? Ugh. Though this looks like an object perfect for deep sea diving, it was actually built for desk work. Hugo Gernsback was a Luxembourgish American inventor, writer, editor, engineer, designer, businessman, and of course, magazine publisher, because why not add one more thing to the list he's really good at? He started a magazine called Science and Invention, which encouraged scientific and amateur experimentation. This was one of the inventions published in the magazine and was revealed in July 1925. The main purpose was to block out all of the noise from the surrounding environment, narrow the field of view like horse blinders to improve concentration. But don't worry, there was an oxygen tube attached to help out the study year, so you know you could you could breathe while you're reading about Shakespeare or something. Number 9, kangaroo boxing. Link here. This next one looks pretty self-explanatory, but also so it's very confusing at the exact same time. Kangaroo boxing actually became pretty popular in the 1800s. In both Europe and the United States, clowns and professional boxers would square off against marsupials in front of herds of people. It was actually started by a university professor just like as a joke and then it really caught on. Who they cheered for? One can't be certain. The man in the above photograph was sparring against a kangaroo in Germany in 1924. Obviously, the sport did not continue as it was considered abusive to animals who clearly had no idea 
why this hairless being was all up in their space and trying to beat them up. I don't understand. This is just ridiculous. Number eight, children shipped in the mail. Picture here. Sounds ridiculous is ridiculous. But did it happen? Of course it did. However, this picture was actually staged, but this actually did happen. Imagine your sister calling you and telling you your nephew is visiting, and then minutes later the doorbell rings and your nephew is just like chilling with some packing peanuts in a cardboard box. Well, not quite. The postman had to play a kind of babysitter a bit. Shortly after package delivery, a revolutionary thing on its own, was introduced, a couple in Ohio sent their infant son to their grandmother's via post in 1913. It cost 15 cents plus $50 insurance. Once this oddball story got out, the trend caught on. Regulations were vague about what you could and could not send via post, so why take a bus when you could take a postman? Rural townships also usually knew their postman really well, so they'd be like, oh come on Joey, here's 15 cents, take little Timmy to my aunts, I don't know. So they trusted them, they weren't just passing them off to strangers. However, eventually new regulations came out banning the practice, finally, because it's just weird. <laughs> In our number seven spot today, we have the Boston Marathon. This photo comes to us from 1967, and it depicts the struggles that Catherine Switzer went through in order to be the first female to finish the Boston Marathon. The photo shows race organizers as well as other participants trying to stop her from running the marathon that she had trained for and was more than capable of completing. She has written a book that explains in great detail all of the things she went through that day and how the critiques and opinions about a woman running the race started even before she had registered to run. People in our history like Catherine are very important, as well as photos like these, because they show when people were literally trying to drag her down, she just kept on running. In our number six spot today, we have the reenactment. This photo is extremely unsettling, and for a very good reason. If, when you look at this photo, your instincts tell you that the guy in them is creepy, ding, ding, ding. You're right. This is a photo that features the German serial killer Joachim Kroll. He is known for taking the lives of 14 people, all varying in age, and he is also known for consuming parts of their flesh. This monster was caught in 1976, and he was discovered when police found out that he had been clogging the plumbing in his apartment with the remains of one of his victims. How gruesome is that? This photo was taken shortly after he was caught and arrested, and what you're seeing is Kroll reenacting one of his crimes for the police. I get goosebumps just thinking about that. I couldn't imagine being there or being the police officer that he's on top of. Talk about terrifying. I'm just glad that they caught him and got him off the street. In our number five spot today, we have the Stanley Hotel. This is a photo of the Stanley Hotel, which is the hotel that inspired the famous Stephen King novel, the Shining. This hotel was under construction in the early 1900s and saw a fateful day in 1911. There was an unexplained explosion that happened in room 217. In the explosion, a chambermaid was seriously injured, but she did end up surviving and she actually returned to work. A few years later, she passed away and ever since her passing, there have been tons of guests who swear that they saw her ghost. Guests have said that they have seen her around the halls of the hotel, but the place that gets the most paranormal normal activity is of course room 217. This is the room where Stephen King and his wife stayed for one terrifying night in 1974. Apparently they were actually the only guests at the hotel for this night, which at any other hotel might be kind of cool, but I feel like this is not what you want from a haunted hotel. In our number four spot today we have the Rothschild Surrealist Ball. The Rothschild family is one of the wealthiest and most powerful families there has ever been. For years and years there have been many rooms swirling about just how powerful and influential they really are, and there are some pretty crazy theories out there. In 1972, the family held a surrealist ball, which is where this photo comes from. These photos could potentially be very innocent, but there is just something about these very elaborate masks, coupled with the theories about what this family is really up to, that just makes it feel very eerie. I know it's kind of like conspiracy feeling, but I don't know. There's something very haunting about this. This party 
is one of the most legendary there has ever been, and whether or not they really are involved in shady dealings, that still is pretty impressive. In our number three spot today, we have John Lennon. Of course, we all know John Lennon as one part of the Beatles who went on after they disbanded to have a very successful solo career. Lennon was not only a musician, but he was also a peace activist who was strongly anti war. He was not afraid to display his activism and held a two week anti war demonstration. There was a period of three years where the Nixon administration was trying to have him deported for his criticism against the Vietnam War. That's how active he was. On December 8th, 1980, Lennon was leaving the Dakota apartment complex when he was stopped by a man named Mark David Chapman. Lennon signed an autograph for Mark, which is what is happening in this photo, and then Lennon went on his way. Little did he know, Mark was going to shoot him later that night. Once Lennon returned to the apartment complex, Mark was there waiting for him to commit his crime. Mark has said he did it mostly for attention, which is very horrifying, but Mark is also a very religious man who explained that Lennon once saying that the Beatles were more famous than Jesus is what really pushed him to commit this crime. It is very crazy that this photo was captured when Lennon was being so kind to who he thought was a fan, and no one would have ever predicted what would happen just a few hours later. In our number two spot today, we have the Hindenburg. This is a photo that was taken during what is now known as the Hindenburg disaster. It is commonly known that blimps, or these kinds of floating airships, use helium in them to float through the air, and it's important to note that helium isn't the choice because it's the only option, but rather because it's one of the safest options, and that is due to the fact that it isn't extremely volatile. Because of a US ban on the exportation of helium at the time, i.e. the Helium Control Act of 1925, although the Hindenburg was designed to use helium, there was a lack of it available, so on the day of the Hindenburg disaster, the much more flammable hydrogen was used instead, and this led to, well, complete disaster. When the Hindenburg floated off on May 6th, 1937, it disastrously caught fire during its flight, with 97 people on board. Sadly, due to the fire, there were 35 casualties on board the flight that day. It is an absolutely horrendous situation, which teaches us all a very valuable lesson. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have Mount Pinatubo. This is a photo that is showing Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines on June 15th, 1991. That is the day that this volcano Volcano erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Certainly impressive, also extremely terrifying. This photo shows the pyroclastic flow full of hot gas and rock being flung into the air. Eruptive activity at the volcano first started on April 2nd of that year, which prompted researchers to set up seismographs in the area. By June, the volcano was having a couple of progressively shallower eruptions before, on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular spectacular eruption, which sent an ash column 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Additionally, smaller explosions continued on June 13th, which then led to some intense seismic activity. After more highly gas-charged magma reached the surface, on June 15th, the volcano once again exploded, this time sending the cloud of ash 40 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Volcanic ash and pumice blanketed the surrounding areas and pyroclastic flows filled what were once deep valleys with fresh volcanic deposits. It was truly magnificent and extremely powerful, and this photo shows just that. In 10th place, we have the criminal George Washington. The George Washington, whose gravestone is pictured, was not the first US president, but the first prisoner executed via electric chair in Texas. On February 8th of 1924, Texas executed a total of five inmates using its brand new electric chair, which remains a state record for the highest number of executions in a single day. In 1923, Levi Todd, who lived in the same area, made himself a new gambling table and promised George Washington he would give him the leftover lumber. But Levi gave the wood to another man, and George was so incensed that he uh, shot and killed Levi as he sat playing poker with some friends seated around that uh, new table. And to add to his crime, George shot Levi's terrified wife as she ran past a window in the uh, Todd home. Mrs. Todd thankfully didn't die. He shot uh, the Todd's dog and emptied his bullet device trying to kill one of the poker players, Frank Larry. But none of his bullets struck Frank and he emptied his own safety device at Washington, hitting him with a load of buckshot. When the shooting subsided, Washington ran into the woods only to be discovered a few days later as he slept and well, the rest is history. I do have a fun fact for y'all though. The electric chair actually has a name. 
Old Sparky, and it is currently on public display as part of a replica death chamber at the Texas Prison Museum in Huntsville, Texas, along with tubing and straps used in Texas's first execution by lethal injection. Cool. I might go visit that museum now. In ninth place, we have Victorian death photographs. Photographs of loved ones taken after they died may seem kind of morbid by today's standards, but in Victorian England, they were a way of commemorating the dead and blunting the um, sharpness of grief. Remember, unless you were rich enough to have a painting commissioned, there really wasn't a way to preserve visual proof that someone existed, and how they looked for future generations. In images that are both unsettling and strangely poignant, families pose with the dead, and consumptive young ladies elegantly recline, the disease not only taking their life, but increasing their beauty. Victorian life was suffused with death. Epidemics such as diphtheria, typhus, and cholera scarred the country. And from 1861 onwards, the bereaved queen made mourning fashionable. Trinkets of memento mori, meaning remember you must die, took several different forms and existed long before Victorian times. Long exposures when taking photographs meant the dead were often seen more sharply than the um, slightly blurred living because of their, you know, uh, lack of movement. On some occasions, eyes would be painted onto the photograph after it was developed, which was meant to make the deceased more um, lifelike while other times death was more obvious. Locks of hair cut from the dead were arranged and worn in lockets and rings, death masks were created in wax, and the images and symbols of death appeared in paintings and sculptures. But in the mid-1800s, photography was becoming increasingly popular and affordable, leading to memento mori, photographic portraiture. Try saying that five times fast. You don't want to know how many times I failed. The first successful form of photography, the daguerreotype, was an expensive luxury, but not nearly as costly as having a portrait painted, which previously had been the only way of permanently preserving some was image. As the number of photographers increased, the cost of these photos fell. Less costly procedures were introduced in the 1850s, such as using thin metal, glass, or paper rather than silver. I see where Weekend at Bernie's got their inspiration. In eighth place, we have a ghostly mural. The ghostly figures shown in this mural in the Karl Strauss Tunnel in North Rhine-Westphalia, Germany, depict the 21 young people who died in a stampede in 2010 at Love Parade, a German music festival. At least 500 others were injured in the devastating tragedy. The Love Parade was a free access music festival and parade that originated in 1989 in Berlin. The parade featured stages, but also had floats with music, DJs, and dancers moving through the audience. The Love Parade in Duisburg was the first time that the festival had been held in a closed off area. Between 200,000 and 1.4 million people were reported to be attending the event, and 3,200 police were on hand. As a consequence of the disaster, the organizer of the festival announced that no further Love Parades would be held, and that the festival was permanently cancelled. Criminal charges were brought against 10 employees of the city of Duisburg and the company that organized the event, but eventually rejected by the court due to the prosecutor's failure to establish evidence for the alleged acts of negligence and their, um, oh yeah, causal connection to the deaths. The mural was established by an unknown artist as a reminder of the sad day. Number seven, mummies for sale. Considering the frenzy that people get into when archaeologists discover a new mummy, you might be surprised to learn that this picture is actually a street merchant selling mummy merchandise of actual actual mummy. During the Victorian era in the 1800s, Napoleon's conquest opened the gates of Egypt to the Europeans, making mummies a really hot commodity. Like imagine somebody bury like uh, uncovering your aunt and going, "Ooh, we could sell her." Weird, right? Like 1000 years from now, they could be purchased from street vendors just as you see from this photo. The Euro elite used to even have mummy unwrapping parties, which is exactly as it sounds and not what you would expect people to do with a corpse. But even weirder than that, people actually thought ground up mummies had medicinal properties. It was so popular that it even instigated a counterfeit trade to meet the massive demand for magic mummy ground stuff. What did the counterfeit trade involve? The flesh of beggars instead of mummies. All that behind one picture. Number six. Half and half. This next one actually has a kind of sad story behind it, but paints a very clear picture of the division between Catholics and Protestants and actually just religion in general. This picture depicts two graves in the Netherlands, one belonging to a Protestant and the other a Catholic. In 1842, a 22 year old Catholic noblewoman fell passionately in love with a 33 year old commoner, a colonel in the cavalry who was also Protestant, a big no no. Their marriage was a total scandal, but they said, screw you to their peers and stayed together for 40 years. The woman's husband died in 1880 and to forever unite them, she built a grave that would forever keep them together even though they were apart by a wall. 
The old cemetery was strictly divided into Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish sections. So these two monuments were built so they could forever be together. Does anybody have a tissue? Number five, Leo the Lion. Believe it or not, you've seen this lion before. In fact, you've probably seen him many times while watching your favorite films as a kid and even now. The lion in the photo is the one, the only, Leo the Lion, the majestic beast who roars the MGM logo, like the old one. Leo the Lion was the regular star of MGM since it was founded in 1924. The first MGM lion was called Slats, not Leo, and he actually didn't roar, he was just kind of like looking around, it was more like a gif. But Leo is actually the most familiar roar, like everybody knows what he sounds like. But who is the man having tea with such a lion? Well that of course is Alfred Hitchcock, the king of thrills. This photo was taken in 1957 of the two legends posing to enjoy a hot cup of British tea. Number 4, Walter Yeo. Though the picture itself is a little disturbing, it signifies a life changing moment for Mr. Walter Yeo and also for thousands more. This was one of the world's first plastic surgery procedures. Walter Yeo had suffered a dreadful accident while manning guns on the HMS Warspite during World War I. He lost both his upper and lower eyelids in the event. A year later, however, he met Sir Harold Gillies, who would be considered the father of plastic surgery. His idea was to take skin from another part of Yeo's body and place it over the area in like a mask-like shape, as you can see in the photo. Dr. Gillies then went on to carry out the surgery on 5,000 injured men from June 1917 onward. And thanks to his work, thousands of people have benefited since the years of the war. Yeo himself lived until he was 70 years old. Number three, the Dinosphere. The car of the future that really never made it there, and we can see why. Every car we have today has four wheels, not just one. Some have more than that now, it's getting confusing. But in the 1930s, J.H. Purvis had a vision. He called it the Dinosphere. It was a large wheel with a cabin in the center for the driver and the passenger to sit. Funny enough, it did actually work. Check this out. But did anyone else notice the problem with driving it? Yeah. You have to drive like Ace Ventura with his window open because it broke, you know what I mean that scene? Exactly. In order to see past the giant wheel spinning in front of you, you have to kind of rubber neck it out to the side. JH made two prototypes, one ran on gasoline and the other ran on electricity. He even designed a kind of bus version that could fit more passengers, but it still needed mini stabilizer wheels, so it had like six by the end of it. Do I kind of want one though, because it looks fun? Absolutely. Would I want to take it on a road trip across Canada? Absolutely not. Number two, the Hindenburg disaster. Based off the title, you already know that this is a picture of the Hindenburg disaster because I already said it. Spoiler alert. The Hindenburg was the largest dirigible ever built and it was the pride of World War II. Yeah, see, Germany, you know which one I'm talking about. The, but YouTube gets mad. The first successful airship was constructed in 1852 by Henry Giffard, but the problem was he used hydrogen. This made both French and German designs of the craft susceptible to explosions if something went wrong. Hence, exhibit A. What you are seeing in the photo is the direct aftermath of a devastating accident. On May 6, 1937, the dirigible touched a mooring mast in Lakehurst, New Jersey, sparking the explosion, which took the lives of 13 passengers and 21 crew members. Something as simple as a small spark from the engine ignited the hydrogen core, and the craft fell 200 feet to the ground in flames. And last but not least, number one, spectators. This is the photo taken at the trial of Al Capone. Yeah, it suddenly makes a lot of sense as to why people are covering their faces. When someone says to you 1930s gangster, Al Capone probably jumps into your head. He was deemed public enemy number one by the US government for bootlegging and other illegal rackets during prohibition. The terror the ruthless gangster incited in the city of Chicago is evident by this image. Witnesses and spectators of the trial covered their faces so they wouldn't be recognized by Capone's vengeful accomplices or Capone himself. Behind those fedoras may lie other criminals yet to be unmasked, or civilians scared of a Tommy gun waking them up at night. Either way, you know he must have been one terrifying dude. Authorities did everything they could to catch him, but he would always slip right through their fingers. 
Finally, his reign came to an end in 1931 when they caught him on income tax evasions of all things that landed him an eight year sentence. So starting us off at number 10 is Phantom Clouds and Darkness. Nebula IRAS 05437 plus 2502 doesn't have a very catchy name. These are NASA experts after all. As we learned from Elon Musk, their naming creativity even for literal offspring doesn't go much further than point and pick some numbers and letters. But it does certainly look like it's a surrealist painting to say the least. I could honestly get lost in the layers, arches, and rolling clouds that create an almost religious image with just how awe-inspiring it is. Staring at it long enough, you may see a phantom rising up from the back of the dust clouds or an angelic figure at the top of the floating yet mountainous staircase with an arched entryway. NASA and ESA's Hubble Space Telescope took this image in 2010, but scientists are still unsure what causes the bright glowing arc near the center. Maybe it's truly divine. Number 9 is, well it's hard to find words, but its name is the Gaping Maw. Ew, don't like that personally? Anyways, it's specifically the Gaping Maw of a sunspot. The sun is an active place with filaments, holes, and flares that are constantly shifting across its face like a pool of liquid magma. That what you see is a close up look at a very dramatic sunspot as seen by the Big Bear Solar Observatory's telescope in 2010. This gabe could be compared to a few things. Maybe the toothy opening of the Sarlacc pit in Star Wars. Or if you fired a bullet through a grapefruit like the Mythbusters. I can tell you from my very unfortunate experience that this is also kind of what it's like to look into a puncture wound on the human body and see the tissue inside. No matter what you see, I'm sure it's something uncomfortable enough that you just want me to move on. So I will. Number 8 is Ghostly Hand. I'm not even a Marvel fan and their franchise is what I thought of when I saw this picture. It's giving Scarlet Witch or Doctor Strange or even Morgan Le Fay, which if you've seen the recent video, Historic Sorcerers that actually had powers, you'd know is a character of Arthinian legend found in the Marvel Strike Force comic series that Audrey Plaza will be playing on the big screen. If you haven't seen that video, maybe check it out. And while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe to The Hive. Anyways, this ghostly hand was caused by a pulsar lurking in the center, which to quote, is a rapidly spinning neutron star, which is spewing energy out into the space around it to create complex and intriguing structures, including one that resembles a large cosmic hand, according to NASA, who snapped the picture in 2009 with their Chandra X-ray observatory. Thanks to the pulsar, a disembodied phantom-like hand looks to be grasping at the void. In seventh place, time to meet American physicist Harold Agnew. As you might have assumed, pictured is, yep, that physicist, holding the nuclear core of the Fat Man atomic bomb, which was dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The bomb ended up killing about 80,000 people, many of which who died from the long-term effects it caused, like radiation illness and leukemia. It was the second of the only two nuclear weapons ever used in warfare, and its detonation marked the third nuclear explosion in history. It was built by scientists and engineers at Los Alamos Laboratory using plutonium from the Hanford site, and was dropped from the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress boxcar piloted by Major Charles Sweeney. The name Fat Man refers to the early design of the bomb because it had a wide round shape. Fat Man was an implosion type nuclear weapon with a solid plutonium core. In sixth place, we have Carl Wallenda. Carl Wallenda was a German American high wire artist and the founder of the Flying Wallendas, a daredevil circus troupe whose members performed dangerous stunts far above the ground, often without a safety net, and still perform to this day. The photo that stayed with me was from a triumphant moment in 1978, just after he crossed the Tower Bridge in London by, yep, tightrope. Later that year, at the age of 73, Carl attempted a walk between the two towers of the 10-story Condado Plaza Hotel in San Juan, Puerto Rico, on a wire stretched 121 feet above the pavement. As a result of high winds and an improperly secured wire, he lost his balance and fell during the attempt, and it was caught entirely on camera. Speaking of the Flying Wallenda Troop, as I mentioned before, they still perform to this day, with Carl's great grandson, Nick Wallenda, breaking world records and performing feats that make my stomach turn. In fifth place, we have the Challenger explosion. On January 28th of 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger broke apart 73 seconds into its flight, killing all seven crew members aboard. The spacecraft disintegrated 46,000 feet above the Atlantic Ocean, off the coast of Cape Canaveral. Florida at 1139 a.m. and it was the first fatal accident involving an American spacecraft while in flight. The mission, designated STS-51L, was the 10th flight for the orbiter and the 25th flight of the space shuttle fleet. The crew was scheduled to deploy a communication satellite and study Halley's Comet while they were in orbit, in addition to taking school teacher Christina McAuliffe into space. The latter resulted in a higher than usual media interest and coverage of the mission. The launch and subsequent disaster were seen live in many
many schools across the United States. The cause of the disaster was the failure of the primary and secondary redundant O-ring seals in a joint in the shuttle's right solid rocket booster. The record low temperatures the morning of the launch had stiffened the rubber O-rings, reducing their ability to seal the joints. Shortly after liftoff, the seals were breached, and hot pressurized gas from within the SRB leaked through the joint and burned through the aft attachment strut, connecting it to the external propellant tank, ET for short, then into the tank itself. The collapse of the ET's internal structures and the rotation of the SRB that followed through the shuttle stack, traveling at a speed of Mach 192 into a direction which allowed aerodynamic forces to tear the orbiter apart. Both SRBs detached from the now destroyed ET and continued to fly uncontrolled until the range safety officer destroyed them. The crew compartment, human remains, and many other fragments from the shuttle were recovered from the ocean floor after a three-month search and recovery operation. The exact timing of the deaths of the crew is unknown, but several crew members are thought to have survived the initial breakup of the spacecraft. The orbiter had no escape system, and the impact of the crew compartment at terminal velocity with the ocean surface was too violent to be survivable. The disaster resulted in a 32-month hiatus in the space shuttle program. In fourth place, we have death recreations. Honestly, looking at this photo, it looks just like the special effects team for a movie studio or a haunted house, you know, just doing their job. But sadly, the reality is much more grim. In 1980, forensic artists were recruited to reconstruct the facial features of nine unidentified victims so that photos could be released by the media in an attempt to identify them. Oh, uh, pardon me, I got a little ahead of myself. The victims belonged to one John Wayne Gacy, otherwise known as the Killer Clown of Cook County, Illinois between 1972 to 1978. He killed over 33 individuals during his reign of terror inside of his ranch-style house in Norwood Park Township. I could go into details about how he committed his crimes, but I don't feel like scarring anyone today. All you need to know is that he gave magic tricks a very bad name. In third place, we have the room where the Romanov family were killed. The Russian Imperial Romanov family were shot and bayoneted to death by the Bolshevik revolutionaries under Yakov Yurovsky on the orders of the Ural Regional Soviet in Yurketa on the night of the 16th to 17th of July, 1918. Also killed that night were members of the Imperial Entourage who had accompanied them. Court physician Eugene Butkin, lady-in-waiting Anna Demidova, footman Alexei Trupp, and head cook Ivan Karitanov. The bodies were taken to the Kaptiaki Forest, where they were stripped, buried, and, uh, with grenades to prevent identification. In second place, we have camp staff taking a day off. Now, to the unknown eye, this is a very innocent picture, and you might be asking why it's so high up on this list. I'm gonna ask y'all to pay close attention to the uniforms that people are wearing. Still not making sense? This photo is of Auschwitz staff enjoying pleasant days off. They look like camp counselors, but their job is, uh, oh yeah, killing people in horrible ways, and they enjoyed it. Most probably took lives not shortly before or after this was taken. Easily the most unsettling photo for me today, since the absolute contrast makes my stomach turn. And in first place, we had the Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571. This picture was taken of a group of survivors of that crash in the Andes. They're all smiling in this photo, but it becomes eerie when you see the um, human spine to the right of them in the photo. I'll get to it, I promise. On October 13th of 1972, human error caused the plane and the 45 folks on board to crash into the Andes mountain range in Argentina, just shy of the border within Chile. Amid the wreckage of the mangled plane on a mountain glacier about 80 kilometers east of the planned flight route, 33 passengers were still somehow alive. Five people didn't survive the first night of below freezing conditions on the mountain in the remote Andes, and a sixth person died within days. Those who were still alive and not, you know, critically injured or in a coma used parts from the plane to create shelter, snowshoes, goggles, and also figured out a way to melt snow for drinking water. The survivors had no medical supplies or appropriate clothing and were stranded on the mountain as temperatures plunged to like minus 30 degrees Celsius. The little food they had was quickly running out. In a cruel twist, the survivors had found a transistor radio in the wreckage and were using it to listen to updates on the search effort. On day 11, they heard the announcement on the radio that the search for them had been uh, called off. Starvation soon set in. They had eight bars of chocolate, a tin of mussels, three jars of jam, some nuts and dried fruit, and some lollies and a bottle of wine. That's all they had to eat, and that was gone within a week. Desperate, the survivors ate cotton and leather from the plane seats. Okay, alright, time to talk about that spine. So eventually, as the bodies of the frozen dead laid around them, the survivors were forced to consider their only chance for survival. All the passengers were Catholic and held deep moral concerns about eating their relatives, teammates, and friends from school, but as a group reluctantly decided eating the bodies of the already dead was their only chance of making it off the mountain alive. They also mutually agreed that if any of them died, the others could eat them for sustenance. Eventually, on December 22nd, which was 72 days after the plane crash, search crews finally recovered the 16 remaining survivors. 